All right. All right. Welcome to a special edition of Real Hawk Talk. And we're coming out with our second episode of the week. And as a lot of you listeners have pointed out to us in our last show, there were some audio issues that kind of sucked the life out of the second half of our uh, Tuesday show. And as a result, we've decided based on kind of the feedback and all the news of the week that we've come back with a special second show this week. We got a whole cast of characters from Hawk Blogger and we got a really fun show lined up for you guys based on all the news that has happened this week, a day before the Seahawks play tomorrow against Minnesota, seven o'clock Eastern, seven o'clock Pacific time. And yeah, before, before that Tuesday's show, um, Brian had a special sponsor announcement to make and, I think we lost some of it on audio, so I'm going to let Brian take it away from here before we get into the show. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, apologies for folks. I'm amazed that people actually took the time to really listen to that podcast because I tried listening a little bit to figure out what was going on with the audio. It was brutal. Uh, I could not understand half of what I was saying, and that's wasn't because I had good beer. It was uh, something going on with the tech, and... Uh, so we switched it up. We're trying something new. Hopefully, this works a little bit better for folks. Um, we've got some live viewers. We'll, you know, hopefully be able to take some questions. Um, and we've invited some of the gang uh, to join us today. So we'll introduce those guys in a second. But before we do, um, want to say thank you as always to Steam Donkey Brewery uh, down there in Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, John Bennett and his uh, his wife started this brewery. It's a kind of a lifelong passion of theirs. That they've just gotten going. And uh, they sent me this uh, growler of Azco IPA, A Z C O E. Let's get a little pour here. Uh, sorry, guys, I cannot teleport this to you. I'm, I'm only a little bit sorry. But cheers to all of you. We'll uh, we'll figure out a way to get some beers over your way. And uh, <laughs> as I did to Jeff on Tuesday. I actually admit I'm kind of happy that we had some technical issues because now I get to taunt him again with beer from uh, a distance. <laughs> uh, this is really good stuff. It's really, really good. Uh, I, I love beer myself, and um, this is uh, very drinkable. So if you like IPA, um, if you're going down Aberdeen Way, um, find yourself some Steam Docky Brewery uh, and grab some beer. All right. Um, so, as we said, we're going to introduce some new folks uh, to the show, and we only have Evan for a little bit because he is athletic, fit, he's got better <laughs> things to do with his time than be on the phone, you know, on video, talking Seahawks. He's got two softball, back-to-back -back softball games coming up. Uh, and, and so, I want to introduce Evan, um, and then we'll introduce uh, Nathan Ernst, and uh, then we're going to talk to Evan a little bit about uh, Justin Britt and signing. So, Evan... Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you write on Hawk Blogger, and, and when, when you became a Seahawks fan. Yeah, so I basically became a Seahawks fan. Uh, actually, probably later than most of you guys, I became a Seahawks fan right around 2008 when the Sonics left. I was actually, as a kid, like a young teenager, I was really into basketball and grew up going to tons of Sonics games. And honestly, the Sonics were actually my first love before the Seahawks. And when the Sonics left, you know, it left a hole in my heart and it kind of, it kind of left an opportunity where it kind of pushed me towards football a little bit more. So started really following the Seahawks in 2007, 2008 era. Um, just been an avid fan ever since. Uh, I interned for over the cap in college. I've always been super into like the nerdy numbers, contract side of things. So, um, Met with Davis uh, Hisub like years ago in a in a Kirkland Starbucks and was like, I, I remember tweeting him when I had like I think like ten followers and I was like, dude, wh where do I get a cap internship? Where do I study the salary cap? And he was like, you know, I I'll run an internship like an amateur internship, you know, just messing around. And basically, we met up at Starbucks a couple times. I remember him just like. Literally, like I was, I was sitting there just absorbing info for like three hours straight, and yeah. So, so Davis has always kind of like been like a role model of sorts for me in terms of the salary cap. So uh, I've always kind of like studied under you there. Room. You know, that, that just blows all your credibility if Davis is your role model. <laughs> you know, so but, yeah, that's, uh, no, that's a little bit about my history. Though. That's great, dude, and it, it's been great having you aboard at Hawk Blogger. You write all our salary cap stuff. You're an expert on that stuff. You've been, you're still learning, but you, you know, you have you share all your expertise, and uh, not only that, but you have a a boss, Mike. There, man, like you are showing all of us up with that. Like, man, it's impressive. Thank you for my work. 
Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, All right. So let's let's introduce Nathan, uh, and then we're going to come back to you, Evan, before you have to go uh, strike out a couple times cool. or or do whatever you do at softball. Strike out, um, absolutely. Uh, Nathan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Welcome to the show, and and uh, a little bit about when you became a Seahawks fan and and what you love to write about. Yeah, uh, I actually became a Seahawks fan a little later too, earlier than Evan, um, about two thousand two or so. Um, Growing up, I despised football, uh, and mm. somewhere along the line, I just got super into it, uh, super into the Seahawks, obviously. Um, my biggest thing has always been with my writing and stuff that, you know, I want to I wanna show people the plays, right? So um, way back, you know, 2008, when I really started uh, getting involved in, like, the online community and stuff, you know, people would argue about plays all the time, and I was like, this is kind of silly. We should be able to look at it and just see. And so my big thing has always just been trying to show people you know, with the tape and uh, trying to amateur hour my way through the analysis of it. And then, you know, then talking about it from there. So, Well, you've got a great article on Delano Hill that uh, Jeff's going to ask you about in a little bit. But uh, welcome to the show. And, thanks. you know, just for folks that are watching or are going to watch this later, uh, the four of us have never actually met. Uh, we've met on Twitter. <laughs> we love the Seahawks. And this is one of the things I love about uh, – it's one of the things I love about um, Twitter, even though it's st struggling, I'm, I'm an investor. I'm an investor, baby. I still believe in it. Uh, it's not growing users, but it's a place where you can meet people that share a passion with you, and there's nothing else like it for that. So um, uh, it's been pretty cool and uh, made a lot of good friends doing it. So um, fun having the guys on here for the first time. Uh, Evan, uh, let's talk to you a little bit about um, Justin Britt. Big news of the day. Uh, what was your first reaction? Um, you know, everyone on Twitter seemed to be tagging you when this when this article when this uh, story broke. Yeah, so I remember uh, in my it was like the cat preview article for, article for 2017. I uh, claimed him to be like my number one target for an off season extension, and uh, lo and behold, look what happened. They signed him to a three year, um, 27 million dollar contract. I think it's 15 million dollars total guarantees, and then I think. $5 million fully guaranteed. So I, I think I predicted four years and $37 million total. So I, I, I was obviously wrong on the, on the three versus the four year contract thing, which is a little bit interesting and we can talk about, but, um, yeah, so I, I guess 9.25 million came a little bit close. Um, but yeah, I, I think overall Dude, it's right. I actually think it's a pretty fair nine. deal. That's pretty, that's, that's more than a little bit close. You're being modest. That's pretty darn close. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll take the credit, but um, yeah. yeah so it, it it was. Uh, I, I think it's. There's been a lot of discussion about. You know, is is he worth this much off of one year of play? And I, I think the Seahawks obviously believe so. And I think uh, with the recent Linder contract from the center and in, in Jacksonville, I, I actually think it's going to be a pretty fair deal moving forward. I think uh, Linder won't be the won't be the top of the guy at the top of the center market for long. So I think um, I think it's going to be a fair deal moving forward. I really do. So what what jumped out to you when you I mean obviously contracts take a few days for you to get the all the numbers out there. Um, what are the things aspects that have been reported so far that jumped out to you about Justin Britt's new contract? Yeah, so the number one thing that stands out to me is the five million dollars fully guaranteed, and I just want to talk about this quickly. We see there's a lot of confusion over this. We see kind of two different terms thrown around. The two terms are total guarantees and full guarantees, and they're actually kind of counterintuitive. So fifteen dollar, fifteen million dollars total guaranteed on the contract means that he has fifteen million dollars. Of those fifteen million, it's at least covered under one of the three basic cuts from uh, being cut. And the three types of cuts are salary cap, health, and um, salary cap, health, and there's one more I completely forgot. But um, either way, basically, a total guarantee means that it's covered under one of those three cuts. Mm -hmm. A full guarantee means the player is protected against all three of those cuts. So the $5 million fully guaranteed is like his money no matter what, unless he gets suspended, he like – you know, breaks the law or something. There's probably some language in the contract that, you know, voids those guarantees, but, um, $5 million fully guaranteed is like shockingly low. Um, I remember, I think I have the numbers right here. So the lender contract is 37% fully guaranteed, which is the top of the market for the, for the center market. And then Justin Britt is 18.5% fully guaranteed. So nearly half 
of what Linder got. So the full guarantee is honestly pretty shocking. Um, if the Seahawks wanted to, they could easily release him next March. Like that's how flexible the deal is. So um, wait to see the full contract structure, but the $5 million fully guaranteed is insanely low. Yeah, it's uh, it's another John Schneider. I mean, it's a specialty. People don't really give him enough credit for where he's been a great player acquisition guy, but he's always invested in having a good contract guy to help him and um, really manage the cap. And, uh, you know, it's critical part of being a good GM nowadays is to have that guy or gal. And, um, yeah, you know, my, my next question for you on this would be, uh, you know, the, what's your expected impact of this contract on the current cap? And what are kind of some of the ripple effects that you see from, from the way this deal seems to be coming down? Yeah, so the way uh, so the way this works is Justin Bray is coming off his rookie contract. And basically, he has a super low cap hit right now. Um, I, I'm not looking at the numbers, but it's probably somewhere between like one and two million, maybe just under one million. I could be wrong, but it, but it's but it's small, basically. The cam deal actually opened up cap space. Um, in short terms, basically, uh, Britt's cap hit is super low right now. And with a deal, especially with the signing bonus on a new contract, it's actually going to raise his cap hit probably. Um, it just depends on how much. So it, I have to see like the full contract structure, but I th I'd say it's probably reasonable to assume that the cap that we're going to lose probably like two to three million cap space, maybe, maybe more. It totally depends on the, on the structure of the contract. But the, but the overall, um, thing that like fans need to know is that we actually lose cap space with the, with the Brit extension. So if, if this kind of leaves open the question, you know, if you want to do a Jimmy Graham extension, they're kind of tight right now. What I what I like to say is the Seahawks have four mil in true cap space. If you go to overthecap.com, you'll see like an eight or nine mil number, but that number doesn't include accounting for um, injury reserve, so IR and practice squad and potential future dead money from cuts. So basically, um, the way I like to think of it, it's a more like accurate number is four mil of true cap space before this extension. So we might be dealing with like one to two mil in true cap space after this extension, which is pretty tight for a Jimmy Graham extension. And you're including in that the Tremaine Brock deal. Um, you factored that in. Yeah. So the way that works, the way that works is Brock is actually going to replace somebody on the 53 man eventually. So if, if that makes sense, like somebody is going to be taken off. So the salary difference between those two and that bottom tier player that's that's off, it's like ne it's negligible. It's going to be like fifty k or something, right? Because he's he's veteran minimum. So so um, yeah. So what you're saying is, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, when people are signed to an extension, it actually increases cap space because um, you're taking money that they were making this year and you're you're prioritizing it in a signing bonus, and you know you're. Uh, spreading it out over the crop over the the length of the deal and so like for yeah. example when cam chancellor signed his deal i believe that increased cap space this year is that correct that is correct so the deal is cam had a super high cap hit um in 2017 and basically what they did is they lowered his um his P5, which refers to paragraph five of the CBA, it's um, his, his base salary. P5 equals base salary, if you ever see that on Twitter. So they lowered Cam's base salary this year, gave him a signing bonus, but the signing bonus is prorated over the life of the contract, including the current year. So it actually lowered Cam's cap hit for 2017. That's why you see that I think they gained 1.3 million cap space from the camp from the cam contract they're going to lose space with brett because his cap hit is going to be higher he has a super low brett has a super low base salary right now and it's either going to move upward plus the addition of the signing bonus if that makes sense got it got it so you know in some sense it seems like they they did this in order they they probably did the cam deal to gain a little space and be able to then set up the potential i think you've even talked about that before to have the opportunity to do a brit deal and Absolutely. now you know, if the team wants to do anything else with anyone else, they're going to likely have to move some people um, in order to accomplish that. Is that right? Yeah. So there's several kind of options here. Option one is you convert a current player's base salary to a signing bonus. So like a 2017 base salary, if a player has a large base salary, they can convert it into a signing bonus where it would, you know, add signing bonus proration to the life of the contract. And it's good for the player because it's money fully guaranteed paid out to the player immediately. You don't really want to do that because you're kind of leveraging the future and the Cowboys are famous for that. So if we can avoid that option, I'm like all aboard avoiding that option. But 
Um, the other option is obviously moving a player. And, um, you know, you, there's been tons of talk on Twitter about, you know, potentially moving Curse, which is probably unlikely, but Curse, Jeremy Lane, which is maybe more likely. A um, couple other players, maybe Jimmy Graham, unlikely. But, um, yeah, basically your two options are um, trade a player because we have nobody um, – that we can cut and save like a ton of ton of money that we would want to cut or convert that P five base salary, that first option into a signing bonus, which the Cowboys do, which we don't want to do. So is there, any the one, options. is there anyone that, that, you know, other than Jeremy Lane, he mentioned anyone that comes to mind as potential candidates that could be traded um, to clear up space. Yeah. So I'm actually pulling up over the cap.com right now. Um, another interesting one that actually might be under talked about so Ruben has a 3.7 mil cap hit. Okay, never mind. He'd have three mil in dead money. Uh, Jeremy Lane is the is really the only option unless you want to trade like a big time player. And I don't know if you want to do that. So there's really not many options this year, unfortunately. Um, yeah, no, nobody that's essential. I mean, if you want to go out and trade a core player, be my guest. But I I don't think they're going to do it. So I, I think the most logical option is Jeremy Lane. Got it. Um, so uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm going to ask Nathan and Jeff, um, you know, what's your take on Justin Britt? When you guys heard this news, um, start with uh, you, Jeff. Uh, what, what was your thought when you heard the, the news break that he, he had been extended? I have the same reaction that uh, Danny Kelly kind of put on Twitter today when the news first broke that I was legitimately surprised based on their previous history that they extended one of their offensive linemen. and based on how they've operated, and I know there's been some rumblings that maybe Paul Allen has been influencing the front office that maybe they got to start putting a more sustainable line around Russell. But I was surprised at the timing, number one, because everything I heard, and I know Davis has talked about this on Twitter, seemed to line up for a mid-season extension. And I was kind of in the camp where I would have almost liked to see Britt prove it a little more that one year wasn't an outlier, but... At the same time, it's hard to complain about this because this has been such a recurring problem for the Seahawks and kind of getting that's the, the best player on their line right now, locking him up and at least stabilizing their line. Because the thing I found interesting, actually, I thought of this yesterday when Tom Cable was doing multiple interviews, was he kept talking about how the, they needed to stabilize their line. He mentioned it twice, once with Brock and Salk and once with the, the rest of the press corps. And I look back and their two probably best offensive linemen were pending free agents, Britt and Luke Jokel. Who I can't believe I'm so high on after one preseason game, but <laughs> careful now. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I just gave the caveat. I just gave the caveat. But probably right now, those are your two best offensive linemen. And I was thinking, how the hell can you be stable if you might lose both of your best players and have to go through this whole charade again? So a day later, it kind of makes me laugh because maybe they were th they were onto something, and that's why he kept saying it. But yeah, I don't think I I think it was a good move, and I think the timing which did surprise me is great for the team because it does provide stability that that group has badly needed for three seasons. Yep. Yep. Uh, Nathan, how about you? What, what's your, what's your take? You've watched Brit. You've probably broken him down. What kind of player do you think the Seahawks have here? You know, uh, he's uh, my, my, my thing is with him has been that I don't actually think he's that much better than he was at tackle or guard. I think in a lot of ways he's the same player, but at center, it just works. Um, you know, he sees, um, he sees just defenders differently. Right. And so what he's being asked to do is just a little different and uh, it, the fit is supernatural for him. Um, you know, when I saw the contract uh, before knowing all the details, it seemed a little high, right. But on the, the, just a per year basis, but it, like uh, Jeff said, it was hard to complain, right? I mean, this team has badly needed offensive line help. They have a decent center. They paid him, what is he, like six overall and per year, I think, right now. And, you know, that, that'll go down over time as new contracts roll in. So it's just tough to complain. Um, I didn't get super excited about it because I think uh, the Seahawks have actually been good at finding centers for um, – all the troubles that they've had, right, with one exception of, you know, Drew Nowak. Uh, they've actually rotated in a bunch of guys there, right? Um, but it, it's just nice to see him invest in the line. It's nice to see, see the stability, right? I mean, I got to stop giving Schneider crap about, you know, preaching consistency on the line. He actually locked somebody down now, so that's too bad. But, uh, yeah, it, it was Did good. I just hear some Josh Schneider praise? Oh, my gosh. What was that? Yeah, he finally showed up. Look at him. 
No, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. And then, I mean, and then when the details roll in, right? And, you know, Evan was going crazy about the, the guarantees and stuff like that. And so that's super cool. So uh, nothing to be upset about. And, you know, hopefully Britt can continue to grow, grow as a center. They seem, a lot of people seem to think that he has improved. I mean, he's still young-ish, so he really can improve. Offensive linemen, you know, I think they age fairly well. They continue to improve for a long time. So nothing but positives here. Yeah, I think I'm that's... going to jump in here quickly again. Go ahead, Jeff. The one area you really saw Britt last year is... I don't, I don't know how well you guys remember that Tampa Bay game. It was a terrible game. When Britt was oh, out, <sighs> Joey, Hunt, Joey Hunt played okay, but the communication across the line when Britt went out totally went to crap. And I remember they couldn't block... Bay, Noah Spence was running around fans. Fetty was just whiffing all game on those basic stunt moves, and Russell was just had no shot. And the thing you hear Cliff Averill say, and you hear Michael Bennett say, as Nathan just mentioned, Britt's really taken a leadership role. He's really been more confident with his calls. And uh, I really do expect him to take another leap forward. And you just saw it in that game, even Hunt who graded out fine, the team just couldn't function without that center around them. And we've seen it with Peyton Manning, having that quarterback center relationship is a crucial thing. And to have these guys locked up is great. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really good call. And and I, look, I I do think that Justin Britt has taken a step forward as a player. Um, you know, I, the thing that stands out the most to me and how he he's changed his game is he really got off balance the first two years. He would get he would try to punch and he would be out over his feet. He'd lose balance. I will never forget the game in Carolina. I know everyone's got on their minds when he was left guard, and you know he tried to 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 uh, get a push on uh Kwan short and whiffed entirely <laughs> and led to what ended up being a pick six and you know like it, it was just that was kind of the player he was he was he really struggled in space and he struggled to make contact with the guys in front of him which is a pretty bad thing when you're an offensive lineman and uh what i saw last year was a much more patient player he was letting the play come to him he was not nearly as off balance and if I'm right, uh, there was a, an article or a stat from Pro Football Focus. He was one of only a couple of centers that did not give up a quarterback hit or hurry, I think something like that last year. Um, and so he, he's shown some some progress there. He's always been a pretty solid run blocker. I will admit I was a little bit surprised. Um, not that they signed him, but I, I'd started to convince myself, look, you got Ethan Posick, they've been uh, – Cross training him at center. His natural position might be there. Um, they've got Joey Hunt, who's good. Will Precheck, who doesn't get enough pub. He was the top rated offensive lineman by Pro Football Focus in this first game. And people can say what they want about PFF. And I have definitely said my 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 couple cents on them. Um, you know, he's been a solid player. He's a good center. He can play guard as well. So they had a lot of options. And so it wouldn't have been surprising to me if they decided to say, hey, we've got options at center. We're going to use the money that we would have spent on Brit somewhere else, but they did it. They, they locked him down. We've got one guy who was a pro bowl alternate alternate last year. Hopefully he'll take a next step and be a pro bowler this year. Um, and now they can start building around him. So I think, I think that's a, that's good news. And, um, you know, with that, Evan, if there's anything else you wanted to say before you go, uh, you know, hit a couple doubles, uh, let us know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I just think, uh, the final thoughts on the deal is that it's extremely team friendly. They can cut him next year if they want to. They're not on the. They're not like tied to this guy for the next four years or the next three years after this year. I I, I think it's a. It's nice to see them obviously invest money in the offensive line. It's a it's it's a good problem to have to have so many players where you want to push money into. It's you know there's a lot of teams that wish they had these problems where they have too many elite players and they and you know they don't have enough money to funnel it in all these directions. That's a good problem to have. So. I'm excited about this team moving forward. Hopefully, Justin Brick can take a ne- another step forward. Um, go Hawks. All right, dude. What's your team name? Oh, he's gone. He, he's he's off. I'm sorry. What was that? Oh, I just wanted to know what your team name was for softball. Do you have your team name for softball? Can you hear I'm me? still here, I think. <laughs> you are still here. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to say goodbye, Evan. We should have left you when you were uh, when you were trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys. Have a good one. Bye, yeah. Good luck. Um, so, Jeff, uh, 
you know, we talked about the first preseason game in our, in our last podcast, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it this time and some of the roster where the things are in the roster. But um, Nathan there did an article today. It's up on hawkblogger.com. Um, and uh, he broke down one of the Seahawks rookies that hasn't got as much pub, and that's Delano Hill at safety. Uh, While well, I uh, drink a little steam donkey, uh, why don't you uh, ask Nathan what, what, uh, what he saw? Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting that Nathan came up with this angle because me and Brian, before our sound went crazy, we went through pretty much all the players who really jumped out at us positive or negatively from Naz Jones to Cason Williams. We had mixed thoughts on Trayvon Boykin and some of the offensive linemen. But one of the guys we didn't hit on was Delano Hill, which is why when I saw Nathan's article and I wrote this to him on Twitter today, I totally missed this going through the game the second time. And I just thought the top of your head, uh, Nathan, what really stood out from Hill on film and how did he catch your eye? Maybe a, it was a TV copy or going through the game later. I don't know what it was, but he obviously jumped off to you. So what was it for him? Yeah, I mean, there's so many guys rotating in and out in the game, right? And uh, going into this today, I was like, oh, God, they're going to ask me about somebody that I didn't watch. <laughs> no, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, for me, what caught my eye was when they drafted him and I went and checked out his tape. And, you know, the dude flies around. Uh, incredibly sound open field tackler hits right i mean just a ton of fun to watch and so i just fell in love with him then so you know first preseason game i looked for him found him right and he started doing some some little things right i mean um there were pluses and minuses in his game um but you definitely saw you know i, I think what they drafted him for and that's the physicality the tackling the hitting um and from what you can tell without the all 22 he looked he looked solid in coverage. Um, uh, I think he got he got got once, right? The the big gain down the field, um, which was probably a bad throw, right? And uh, you don't see a lot of back shoulder fades in the middle of the field, so I don't know if he was seeing, <laughs> expecting, expecting that coming. Um, there was another time where you know the tight end maybe got the better of him a little bit, um, but he showed good recovery skills when he did get uh, behind a little bit. Um, physical and coverage uh and you know wasn't challenged much so it was uh a lot of good stuff yeah and obviously the cam chancellor news impacts hill a little bit hill probably thought he was the natural successor to cam at strong safety so now the question is i guess this year and the seahawks have done this so well in the past how do you get hill on the field other than special teams what kind of packages can you see them using his ability to maybe set the edge or using that coverage ability because with cam, cam's gonna play a, a ton of snaps this year especially with that big deal so what do you see there well injuries are the big thing right so he'll be the spot starter probably right It'll, we'll see how it shakes up between him and mcdougald um but he's gonna have to earn a role um which is what you want for a rookie right you don't necessarily want to have to have these guys step in and and start or play a bunch of snaps you know so um he'll have to show what he can do um he'll have to show that he deserves the snaps and then you know pete's pretty good about figuring those things out so you know whether it's a big nickel type thing whether he can play a little linebacker um you know, people talked about him playing nickel corner, which I would personally need to see more. I'm sure the team's seen what they need to see there already, right? But um, I would, I, I would, he's, he's got to prove that one to me at least first. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's there's ways for him to get in there. Um, but, you know, he's going to be a, a, a in the box player. He's going to be a little bit of an enforcer. He's not Cam, right? I mean, nobody is Cam. Uh, nobody's Kenny Easley either. I got somebody commenting that there's more than one enforcer on my post <laughs> uh, easily first. So that was my bad. I feel bad about that one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's got the potential to get in there and earn a role in some kind of in the box fashion, right? Yeah. I saw you mentioned he was your favorite Seahawks draft pick this year. Yeah. What was it on film that made him that way? Because it's interesting when I, I know a couple of people who are, who are supporters of Michigan who are down there and know pretty much everything about the team. And they know I love the Seahawks. So when I kind of dug around to get on Darbo and Hill right after the draft, the one guy they kept telling me is you're going to love Delano Hill. And it's interesting that you had the same reaction just watching the tape. So what was it that did it for you? You know, it, uh, open field tackling can be a little over underrated or yeah, underrated, I guess. Um, it's tough as hell. Um, you know, you got some crazy athletes, you know, and you got to track them down. You got to come down hard, right? 
um, you see a lot of plays in the one that I uh, included in the post, right, with him playing single high, uh, and it's a read option, and JT Barrett, who's a quarterback, but he's a hell of an athlete, right, he uh, zips up the middle, and he's in the open field. And so Delano Hill has to come downhill uh, and, and catch this guy, and he not only does he do it, right, he kind of picks him up and, and puts him into the ground. So his ability to track ball carriers um, and then – punish them when he finds them um, and, and do it really consistently is really cool. I, I can't remember uh, a guy that I've watched that has been so effective in the open field as, as he is. So it's a special quality. His skill set seems perfectly suited for special teams. Yeah. It's not the kind of role you can really see him excelling in as a rookie, kind of like how they use Cam basically in year one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if he wasn't uh, a big-time contributor on special teams. And Brian, I don't know if you want to jump in here with Delano Hill. You uh, went through the article uh, today. I think you've been uh, you've been doing a great job with it. So uh, yeah, you hit hit a lot of the questions I had, and and uh, you know, for folks that haven't been reading as much of Nathan's stuff, uh, I think he does some of the best film breakdowns uh, out there for Seahawks stuff. I've I've always really enjoyed it, and. Um, uh, I think it's a great way to learn. So a lot of people that come to Hawk Blogger, part of the reason they come to our site is because we don't talk down to people um, and we're here to, we, we love football. We're learning about it as well. And I think we all have questions and we share what we learned, you know, as we research to get the answers. And I think uh, Nathan does a really nice job of helping you come along and learn about what to watch and how to get a little bit more of a refined view of the, uh, of the team. So I uh, definitely recommend checking out his stuff on, on there. Um, uh, you know, some, some future time, Nathan, I think it'd be fun. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks that follow us that they, they have questions about how to even do that. Um, and I think uh, it'd be fun to, to spend time in a future episode kind of talking about that, even showing people kind of how you are able to, to record that stuff, even the technical stuff. Some people care about the nitty gritty and um, we'll get to that in the future. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, where do you think Hill could fit on the field? And, you know, you, you talked about, we talked about special teams. Jeff called that out. I think that's a no brainer. Um, Cam was like a, his role, his rookie year when, when there was lawyer Malloy starting at, at say, strong safety was that Cam chance would come in, in uh, short yardage and goal line situations as an extra safety in the box. Do you think that that's possibly the type of role Hill could take on um, in his rookie year, even if it's just a small one? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, there were a, a couple situations um, in the preseason game where he wasn't quite assignment correct from what I could tell. Uh, and so, you know, he's going to have to clean up that kind of stuff before they trust him on goal line, I would, I would think, right? Um, but definitely slots in there, right? Because he can definitely... Um, he can definitely shrug off tight ends, fullbacks, right? He can definitely come up and take on a guard or, you know, an offensive lineman and and hold his own there. So he could definitely be an asset uh, on the goal line. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the big nickel concept that people have been talking about for a long time with the Seahawks that we see other teams implement um, that the Seahawks haven't really actually gone to. Uh, if he can play clean, right? I mean, he's got the athleticism. Um, he's got the ability to tackle. He's got, you know everything you need where he could start to be a weapon against some of these teams um, that, you know, feature the, the pass catching tight ends, right. Which there are obviously a ton of now. Right. Um, so come in and, uh, you know, move into a, a nickel over a tight end or, uh, you know, line up inside and take on, you know, uh, in the run game. Um, he could get, he could be really flexible there and do a lot of things. Um, and so that's where I think I think you look at him in you know special teams for sure, um, injuries spot starter for sure, uh, and then you kind of work him in through goal line and, and maybe see what he can do in coverage. Uh, we, we touched on this in the last episode a little bit before our audio came out, and I imagine you'll be watching Hill closely. But heading into the game tomorrow night against Minnesota, where you'll probably see more of the regulars, more of, who are some guys you're going to be closely watching? Uh, whoever's playing opposite Sherm for sure. Um, I don't know if they'll get Brock in there that quick. Probably not, I guess. Um, he'd be interesting to keep an eye on. Um, Quill, obviously, and then, you know, some of these other guys, too. Uh, didn't get to zoom in on him a lot, but I thought Elliot looked okay at times, even though I think he gave up a couple catches. 
Um, so seeing how that spot's going to shake out is you know, obviously huge. And then just, I think, praying that Preach stays healthy for an entire game uh, or however long he plays. So. Yeah, I, I'm. You got you brought up Big Nickel, and and just for folks that you know, I think probably folks on here know what that is, but just in case they don't, you know, this is this concept the Seahawks have been talking about for a while now, which is uh, uh, having three safeties on the field, pulling a linebacker off, having three safeties on, and you could potentially do an alternative version where you actually keep three linebackers on and you have three safeties and and two corners. Um, uh, uh, sorry, no, you can do that, but, but, but there's different variations you can do there. The point is you can get three safeties on the field. And the idea is that that can help you cover, um, cover a tight end a little bit better. Um, you know, be a little bit more flexible in how you do it. And Bradley McDougald is the guy that they've talked about as, you know, last year was Brandon Browner who they specifically brought in for that role and decided not to keep him. Um, yeah, got to hurt. Let's be honest, it hurt because I Brand Brown is one of my favorite all time Seahawks, even though he's only here for a couple of years. Um, what are you guys what are you guys looking for um, when it comes to the big nickel? Is that something you think is going to make a difference for the Seahawks? Uh, Jeff, what, what's your thought there? Well, I think now with and we've touched on depth so much on our show so far, they have such a more versatile or flexible ability to create packages for safeties that they haven't had in the past. And whether it's McDougal, who's more of a coverage guy who can come up and run support. But I heard Brock Heward say this on the show this morning when he was talking about it. He said he hasn't seen McDougal get beat in practice yet. And that's a, that's a fascinating thing, considering how good the skill position guys are on the Seahawks offense. And he's a really sound player from whether it's tackling, whether it's coverage. And unless you want a guy who can maybe cover big safeties, and that's a job you saw he'll do a little bit, they're really flexible and they can really rotate it based on their matchup, whether you're looking at more of a quick inside slot guy or a big tight end whose tight ends have killed this team in the past. And now you have such a more versatile group of defenders that you can maybe use these, this third safety for. And in the past, they really haven't had that. Kelsey McCray just wasn't an every down player. He was more of a special teams only guy. And Jerron Johnson wasn't this kind of coverage guy that, Hill or McDougal definitely it wasn't that guy. And I can't think of a time where they've had safety depth like this, maybe outside of 2010 when Cam and Earl were rookies and they were struggling to learn the NFL. But even in their best roster years, they haven't had a group of four. If Tedrick Thompson was anything after their, they would even have five safeties, but still unsure about him. And it's, it's a loaded group right now. And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this roster. Yeah, we're gonna get into the. Uh, we're gonna. Sh- I'm gonna show the roster outlook I've got here in a second, and we'll talk a little bit more about Tremaine Brock and about Thompson and, and where there's some trade offs to be made. But, but Nathan, uh, you know, you watch. You've watched enough film, I and mean, would you think that a three safety look would would make a difference um, in how the Seahawks defense plays? It could be huge, really. You know, if they can. Uh, they've moved away from the Sam the last couple of years, right? The, the outside linebacker that plays up um, up on the line. Um, and But they haven't had a real alternative to it. And so I think that we've seen the, the, uh, the run defense kind of slip a little bit. I mean, it's still obviously the defense has been great, right? But I don't think we've seen the dominance that we saw early. And, and part of that's moving away from uh, a five-tech like Red, like Red Bryant too. Um, but if they can get uh, either McDougald or Hill involved in a big nickel type situation where you can, you're more athletic, um, you can, you know, fly around on the underneath routes, right? Not just tight ends. Um, that's where they've gotten beat up a little bit, but they've gotten beat up just underneath in general, right? Um, and still hold your own against the run. That could be really huge. And I feel like they've looked for some kind of an evolution. Um, in their defense the last couple of years, right? Um, uh, I think Chris Richard's had some leeway to experiment a little bit. Um, but, you know, like we're saying, they haven't necessarily had that flexibility or the personnel to actually do it. And now they might. And so they could uh, get creative and uh, maybe address some of the things that, that teams have been able to pick at them a little bit on. Yeah, so let's um, let's swap over. I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to try this uh, this ability here and see if it works for us here. Let me know if you guys can see this in a second. 
me share my screen. Is that showing up for you? Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm going to put this up here. And uh, this is roster outlook that uh, uh, I had. I posted this morning uh, on the, the blog. And there's two things here um, that we'll kind of talk about. Um, you guys are able to see it detailed enough, big enough? <laughs> okay, good. So um, on the left-hand side, we've got what are currently my projections for who makes the roster. And I've got these each position stack rank from top to bottom in terms of confidence I have for them making the roster. And we can talk about players that you guys disagree about and we can go into detail there. Um, I've also got the projected number of those positions that are going to be kept from my pr perspective. Important thing over here on the right is, is supporting information, which is this is for each of those positions, how many players they kept last year and how many players they've kept on average since 2010. Um, this is my current projection about how many players uh, they're going to keep and the difference between last year, um, you know, last year and what I'm projecting to happen this year. So one of the things I want to call attention to, we started to talk about big news, Tremaine Brock, who I've got here as number three cornerback right now is, uh, you know, I think about this as three years, looking out three years, who's the guys that are, you know, just absolute locks to, to be on this team right now because they have value. Richard Sherman, you know, I, he's top cornerback on the team. I have uh, Shackle Griffin as number two. I mean, I think this guy's going to be the, the number one corner eventually. Um, he's not going anywhere. I've got Tremaine Brock as the, the third corner um, on the team right now. Um, you know, either one of you get going on uh, what you thought of the Tremaine Brock signing and what do you think he brings to the team? I guess I can start here. Um, it It's not surprising. I From what I'd heard, they'd been sniffing around veteran cornerbacks the entire offseason and they wanted one at a fair price. And unfortunately, that it came as a result of an, a, a, a domestic violence accusation that was apparently dropped this week. And from the, what the agent said and what the team said, apparently John Sch Schneider did a, a long, extensive search looking into him. But yeah, in terms of what he brings on the field, I think they want him, A, more competition at the nickel spot. And Brock played one of the most cornerback snaps of any cornerback in the league last year. So that adds a ton of experience to them. That adds a ton of depth, both on the outside and as an inside corner. And it's going to make Jeremy Lane really earn his job on the team because really there wasn't much competition for that inside as good as Shaq Griffin's played. Shaq Griffin's a boundary corner. He's built more like Sherman. And DeAndre Elliott can play both spots, but he's more suited, I think, for an outside role. So outside of that, they really needed that got to push Jeremy Lane the nickel. And Brock might be a better nickel corner than Lane is at this point based on his ball skills, based on his skill set, based on his quickness. I think it really adds... If we look past the off-field stuff, everything on-field, it really adds a lot of stability. It adds a lot of depth. And it, the fact that you can flip him as an outside guy, an inside guy, a good coverage guy, as balls, he's he's pretty much a better version of Deshaun Shedd. And having Deshaun Shedd down really hurt this team right now. But I remember around draft time, uh, Mitch, Mitch from KJR was going crazy about how they didn't have kind of that insurance option if Shaq Griffin wasn't ready to play. The draft would be ruined. The draft would be a mess. Brock fits in perfectly as everything he was complaining about. Brock is kind of that guy who can fill in. Is your insurance policy outside? He can play inside if Lane is off or Lane is not as good as kind of the team was reporting on him. So it really adds a good element to this roster and really shapes them up to be a better than they already were. And depth's been the story of this roster all summer. And this just adds another piece that's such a good price it's hard not to like it again yeah and and uh, hand it over to you nathan I, I think uh some of the numbers that come out about brock uh you know this is a guy that played the most snaps at the position last year at corner across the league he's a guy that um according to pro football focus you know i think was third or fourth in the league and run stops at, at the corner position so he's a physical player the other players that were you know seahawks had two or three of the top corners and run stops and they, they really asked their corners to support against the run. Um, he's been durable. He's been, um, you know, relatively productive. And, and as Jeff said, played inside and out, um, you know, what's your take on him versus someone like Jeremy Lane? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so I've only watched Brock a little bit, uh, but when I threw on the tape, you know, I saw him on, on the outside, right. So at the boundary corner. So, 
I think first and foremost, you know, he is competition for Quill as much as he is for Lane. Um, you know, like I said with Hill, you don't want to just hand a rookie uh, a job. And I mean, I think everyone's pretty excited with uh, about Griffin with really good reason. Um, but I, I think I think Quill has to beat him out now. I think you know you really actually slate him in at two. Um, you got to get him in and see what shape he's in, right? I mean, I don't know uh, with the situation where he's been and what he's been doing, but um, so he he gives you a ton of he, he gives you a great option, at, assuming he's ready to go at that second spot. And then if Quill can breed him out, great. Now you got you know Griffin who's ready to go, and uh, I, I think he slots in now to the middle, right? He can play nickel. Um, so now you've got him competing with Lane, right? And the other thing with Lane is uh, he doesn't uh, uh, he doesn't stay healthy all that often, right? He's had injury issues. So um, he's, uh, you know, from a purely on the field perspective, I don't think you could have asked for much better there. Um, so he just provides a ton of competition that I think the team needs there. Yeah, what we're looking at now is uh, his passer rating that he's allowed over the past few years over his career. And um, what you see is a couple of things that, of note. Um, a couple of these seasons where he kind of pops up, those were seasons where he didn't play enough games, um, likely in those cases because of injury. So, uh, you know, he had to, to stand out. The, ga- the seasons where he's, he's you know, played um, enough, you know, he's, he's done d- – decently um as a, as a corner i don't think this guy's a shutdown corner i don't think he's like you know the top of the top of the heap but he's physical um you know he will battle and i think he's a potentially a guy that that can create some turnovers um uh anytime you have a guy that that plays physically like that um you've got a potential to do something pretty interesting so um as we kind of go through this and I'll bring back up the roster projection I have. Um, look, I, I, I kind of, from a pure football perspective, set aside the ethical questions of them, you know, bringing on a guy that's got domestic violence. Um, you know, there's questions around that. Let's set, set that aside. I think it's been talked about a lot. Um, you have to like, for all the reasons Jeff said, having another option from inside and from outside. Um, Jeremy Lane, is, as Jeff knows, is not one of the guys that I'm like super high on. I think he's a fine player, but you know, I would be completely fine if he moved on and was on a different team. Um, I don't think he's an irreplaceable kind of guy. I don't think he has a lot of unique traits, um, and I think he's not. His body's not built to be durable um, necessarily. I don't think he's proven that he can be durable as a player. But I look at this group. Let's just focus on this group for a second. And last year, go back here. Last year, the team kept five corners. On average, they've kept five and a half. So they fluctuate between five and six, right? Well, they've got Richard Sherman, Shaq Griffin, Tremaine Brock, and Jeremy Lane, who I think we all agree, assuming they're not moved for some other reason, they're locked to make the rush. So that's four guys. Then you got guys like Nico Thorpe, DeAndre Elliott, Pierre Desir. Um, I think those guys are in another category. I've got Thorpe kind of pretty firmly above Elliott and Desir, and you guys can argue with me if you'd like here. But, you know, if they go five, then that means DeAndre Elliott's off the team. It means Pierre Desir's off the team. It means Demetrius McRae's off the team. And so you do that. And you've got Deshaun Shedd, who's absolutely expected to be back off PUP midseason. They didn't have to re-sign him, but they did. So two questions. One, um, you know, who are the corners, you know, who are the corners you see making the team? And two, what happens when Deshaun Shedd comes back? Where does he play? Uh, and, and I guess let, let's start with let's start with you, Jeff. I would definitely agree with you in terms of Nico Thorpe's status to start. I think Thorpe's a core special teams player, and you know how much this group values special teams. So I think he's as close to a lock as there is in this group. And I think the question really comes down to, do you keep Lane or Elliot, or do you keep both of them? And I'm starting to think Elliot's few, Elliot might be on the bubble. And that's unfortunate because we both liked Elliot coming into camp. And I'm starting to think that maybe you go with the top five on your list. B. 
Because when Shed does come back, if you take six, I don't know who you bump off unless the only other guy I can see them possibly walking away from is Jeremy Lane now that you have Brock. And I, I think it's a bit of a long shot still because I still think they do like the depth, but his contract kind of sets up where he's in the last year of his deal, probably either way, especially now that they've Brock and Griffin's kind of emerged a little bit. And with all the soft tissue injuries he's been having early on, he hasn't been as available as they would have liked. Maybe since it's a club control thing, they might lean towards Elliott. But the problem with keeping six, as you said, is once Shed comes back, they're going to want to get him in there. So you're going to need to get rid of someone anyway. So I'm st I still lean towards them taking those top five, but I think that would be my prediction at this point. What about you, Nathan? Yeah, you look through here, and they've obviously really gone after special teams, right? Um, you've got Garvin and DJ Alexander that they've gone and got. Um, Thorpe is a special teams ace. I really don't know a lot about him as a cornerback. We haven't seen him a ton there. I don't think he's really highly heralded there. Um, you have Hill, who you think will probably be uh, at least solid there, and McDougal will get a chance to play on teams as well, right? He'll be expected to do that. So you have a lot of guys here you've, that are, you know, pretty well regarded for special teams. So when you're looking at a guy like DeAndre Elliott or Pierre Desir, right, two guys that maybe they can be a starting cornerback, right? If you're talking about Shaquille Griffin being the number one someday, you know, Sherman moving on at some point maybe, uh, you're going to need other boundary cornerbacks. And do you really want to toss aside Elliott or Desir for a special teams guy? Uh, I don't know. Um, and the other option is that maybe they just kind of, maybe they carry seven cornerbacks kind of looking at Thorpe as his own thing, right? Um, every once in a while, they've been willing to carry just a special teams guy. Um, so maybe they have a roster spot there. You know, it's something that's been talked about with McKissick too. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant though to give up on either Elliot or Desir um, this early. I, it was Desir, I guess it's not early. He was in Cleveland for a little while, but Elliot's only the second year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think Elliot's. So you know, as I said, I, I, right now I've got. I've got them keeping six corners. Um, I think they'll keep Thorpe, and I think they'll keep Elliott. Um, now, this is this week. Oh, I'm that is six, them. yeah. I, uh, I miscounted. <laughs> yeah, I've got them keeping both of them. And I have Desir and uh, Demetrius Recrae, who, who doesn't get enough uh, pub, honestly. He wears 39. He actually looks a little like Brandon Brown. He's a big corner. He played in Jacksonville last year. Um, has background with Gus Bradley. Knows the system. I think he's a physical player. I think he's an interesting corner. I don't think he's got a chance in heck of making the roster at this point, but I think maybe a practice squad guy, depending on how much, if he's practice squad eligible. But um, I think they keep six. And the reason I think they keep six guys and the reason DeAndre LA makes it is because, you know, look, when they made the, they did the draft and they took two safeties, they took uh, Delano Hill and they took Tedrick Thompson. And I looked at the numbers back then and they had already signed Bradley McDougald. And I said, wait a second. I don't think we can assume that both Tedrick Thompson and Delano Hill are going to make this roster. And everyone said I was nuts. Of course, they're both going to make this roster. Um, as it is right now, I don't have Tedrick Thompson making this roster. I think they got Bradley McDougal that can play back up either role. They've got Delano Hill that's clearly ahead of Tedrick Thompson at that position. And you've got a guy in Thompson who hasn't stood out yet in practice and did not have a good game uh, in, in his first preseason game. doesn't mean that the door's closed by any stretch, but um, you know, he doesn't have freak physical skills. He's a little bit slower, especially for a free safety. Um, you could argue that Marcus Cromartie, um, who's their other safety uh, played with the 49ers is a good special teams player. Um, you know, I could even make the case that Cromartie has outplayed him so far. Um, you know, I'm not ready to do that. I've got Tedrick Thompson above him still, but look, uh, I could see a situation where the team keeps six corners. They keep four safeties. And when Deshaun, Deshaun shed comes off the disabled list or off PUP, guess what he played when he first came out, he played safety. 
And so you've got a guy there that could swing between corner and safety. Um, you make the bet that you're going to keep that. You, basically what you're saying there is I think Nico Thorpe and DeAndre Elliott are better players long-term than Tedrick Thompson. That's what the bet would be that you're making. And then you say, we're going to wait on Deshaun Shedd when he comes in, you know, we'll have, we'll have our extra safety and we can decide at that point, you know, we'll have learned more about these players you know, maybe we can do do without an extra defensive lineman at that point, or we can do without an extra somewhere else on the roster. There'll be an injury or something else, and they'll have a, a place for shed. So that's how I have it right now. Um, I am probably pretty alone in that. Um, I don't think anyone else has Tedrick Thompson probably off the roster. But uh, honestly, he just he didn't show me anything that makes me say you got to keep him. The last thing I'll say there is, you know, I know people don't want to hear about it, and you know this is not crying over spilt milk. But I like to look back at decisions that were made. I think it's important. When you traded back twice for Malik McDowell, the two picks that you ended up with out of that thing were for Mike Tyson and for Tedrick Thompson. Mike Tyson is absolutely not making this roster, um, and I think there's a chance Tedrick Thompson will make this roster. And so, you know, I don't say that as like let's look back over spilt milk. I say in the future, Duke's got to freaking keep their first round pick. They need yeah. to stop trading out. They need to take the best player available with the first pick they have. And, uh, you know, people can argue volume over, over that high pick. But I think we're seeing time and again, um, when the Seahawks keep trading those first round picks, that's not working out really well for them. There hasn't been a great example of them trading away, whether it's for Percy Harvin or Jimmy Graham or any of these other moves they've made um, that has really worked out for them to trade out of the first round. So, you know, uh, that's where I come back and I, I, I want to see them do a little differently. Um, any thoughts on that from you guys? I mean, that's going to be rough. If they end up cutting Thompson, uh, you know, you got to do the right thing for your team, but you, like you said, you th you traded back. I mean, I'm trying to look at now who they they passed on. Um, I think they missed on – are they uh, – Ryan Ramchick, right? Um, Ramchick, Cam Robinson. Nyoko? Uh, or Nyoku or Njoku or however you say uh, the tight end of man's name. Yep, yep. And they, they traded – passed up Tack McKinley. They passed up Reuben Foster. They passed up uh, Taco Charlton. They passed up – um, you know, there's a pretty long list. That's, that's a, that's a tough lamp. list. Um, uh, a couple other guys. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, again, that's spilt milk, but, um, I think you have to look at those situations and really understand, was it worth it? Did you improve your team by making that decision or both those decisions? And I'm not sure right now that it looks like they improved their team by doing those, those things. But now it's certainly possible he still he still makes it. I mean, of course, uh, you kind of kind of think that he probably makes it based on you know his draft position um, because he hasn't done much else to justify it. Um, and you know he hasn't shown anything yet. But in his uh, college film, I, I wasn't super impressed with. But you know those ball skills were were legit. Like he uh, he can read a play and he can make a he can break on a ball right. Um, He's got to show he can do it at NFL level that he has that athleticism, and, and he's got to show as a safety that he's not going to just be, uh, you know, a speed bump on the way to the end zone for running backs. But uh, probably a little early to to toss him out. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Jeff? Um, I'm sort of with Nathan, but I can see your side of it. I love being um, on an island, guys. <laughs> it's just with that one, it's tough because. I haven't been privy to practice like you have, Brian. I haven't seen him. And the one time I did see him was the mistake he made on that touchdown to Travis Benjamin. So for me, the only thing in my head is that negative play since there's been almost zero buzz on him coming out of camp. And he hasn't really stood out from anyone's perspective. And the, these next three games are huge for him because he needs to start flashing these ball skills that came up in the college tape and the one thing I would worry about moving on from him is that McDougal, I don't know if they'll be able to retain him after next year. And then right. they're again and sheds a pending free agent. Right. They're going to need that backup free safety. And 
there unless there's maybe something they know in the draft coming up that kind of leaves that hole that they've had the last couple of years where you were stuck with someone like who they've had the last couple of years and that was a huge gap behind Earl Thomas. So I would like to see I cuz I don't know if he gets past the practice squad if he's going to be a fourth round pick and the one thing I do think about and I I know people have brought this up lately is kind of the way the draft lined up when they made that Thompson pick and this is just totally off base here is they didn't really draft the tight end this year and I know they've gotten like what they see out of swoops and Marcus Lucas had a good camp the way the draft lined up there was a lot of tight ends around that area and I know John Schneider admitted later he was kind of pissed that the run went at the top of the fifth round looking forward Luke Wilson and Jimmy Graham are both pending free agents Jimmy it might be hard to make room for him given all these extensions that move really there might come back to bite them because outside of Nick Vanette, there's no one really with club control going beyond this year. And there were some good tight ends at that spot. I don't know if they could have kept four this year, but if Thompson doesn't take a step forward, that's another decision in that draft where you're really going to have to wonder because that would have really helped you from a club control standpoint going forward. Yeah, I think that's a good, I, I think Marcus Lucas has had a very good camp and um, uh, I don't think he's going to make the roster, but he was a practice squad lit player last year. It's a guy that could keep around. I don't think he's, you know, the next Jimmy Graham by any stretch. I think swoops is the perfect practice squad candidate. This is a guy who played quarterback in college. Um, I called him out as a sleeper coming into camp before that even started. Cause Anytime you got a guy that's got unique physical athletic abilities that he's proven he, he, he can run tough as a quarterback, he can play physically. Um, and that was able to even get a sniff at tight end, you know, when, when he came out there, he's never even played the position. That's intriguing because people, you know, player people like John Schneider, they don't, uh, you know, they don't just stop. Uh, they don't just bring a guy like um, swoops in there. Who's never played the position unless they think he's got a chance. So uh, he's shown a lot to me. I think in the first preseason game, you saw him line up out wide on a third down play and run a little skinny post and catch it on that on that um, on that play and get a first down. I don't see tight ends do that very often. So I think this is a guy that absolutely you're going to see on the practice squad, unless for some reason another team swoops him up. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, but I think that's that's a great kind of developmental player. Um, you know, we'll see what they do with Jimmy Graham. This could be the year. This could be the year where they finally figure out the red zone. I've seen Russell in training camp really focusing in red zone drills on getting to Jimmy. He's been the number one target by far during red zone drills, which has been good to see. And they've been succeeding. He's been spiking the ball in everybody's face and enjoying it. So, you know, I, I know that's music to everyone's ears. It's been great to watch. If they can... I mean, look, he had six touchdowns last year and they haven't figured it out yet. If they figure it out and this offense is better, where which it should be, there's no reason to think Jimmy Graham couldn't go from six touchdowns to 15 this mm -hmm. year. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities if they figure it out. And if that happens and he loves it and they win a Super Bowl, which let's hope they do, you know, who knows? Things, things seem to work out um, in those situations. So I, I don't know that we need to worry too much about that that quite yet. I want to ask you guys about something else, and we haven't touched on this yet. And if not for the Brit story, this might be the news of the week. Luke Jokel and George Fan are named the new starters at left guard. Not the new starters, the official starters at left guard for week one. That seemed pretty obvious based on the preseason and how they've wanted to stabilize. But I think the bigger story is that it seems like Poch Posich is moving uh, to right guard this week. And based on what we said about a Fetty, in an early, our earlier show this week, it seems like the team is much more comfortable with him than maybe some fans are. So I want to I want to ask you, I guess, Nathan, you can start on this. The right side of the line, how do you see that shaping out? And what are your thoughts on Fant winning that job after what was, by all indications, a really tough first season? Yeah, you know, uh, I kind of saw the Fant thing coming for a little while. Um you know, Cable has his guys, and they constantly went to bat for Fant. And, you know, for good reason, too, right? Like, I mean, uh, he was an easy target because he was awful sometimes. Um, but, you know, he is a basketball player, and he worked his ass off and somehow managed to not, 
you know, bad, but not a like complete disaster. Like you would probably think he should have been last year. So they, they appreciated that. And Cable's got his guys. Um, so I saw the fan thing coming. Um, uh, on the other side of it though, now with the Fetty, I think a Fetty's going the other way. Um, Cable had some comments about how he was disappointed that, that a Fetty missed time. And I only read it. You can, you know, tone obviously doesn't translate there. Um, it struck me as odd that he seemed to be disappointed in a Fetty for uh, getting hit, right? I mean, that was the Clark thing. That's why he missed time. Um, and I, I worry that – well, I don't, I don't worry about it, but I, I wonder if uh, a Fetty is getting in the doghouse, right, the, the Gilliam doghouse. Um, and I wonder if uh, – they're going to do all kinds of stuff. We're going to see everybody play everywhere, kind of. So posters are at right guard right now. Um, if a Fetty goes out and looks the way he did last week, right, and if Post Postage gets the chance and uh, at right tackle again and, and looks the way he did last week, posters look good. A Fetty looked real rough at times. Um, you know, they went to Ibushi as a starter early, only played him a few snaps, which is interesting. Um, tells me they think they know what they have there. Uh, I think you could see a Fetty get rotated out to the bench pretty quickly. Um, I think tomorrow or uh, 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 whatever day the, the Vikings game is on. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I think that could be a, a big, a big game for him for a Fetty. Yeah, I, it's funny, Jeff. Um, so I was I was in the car this morning, or maybe it was no, this would have been yesterday. Yeah yesterday i was in the car listening to cable um doing that interview and and i think he was on with uh mitch i want to say no it was brock and salk i think it was brock and salk yeah anyway um and one he said yep left side's pretty set uh we've got fant we've got jokel we've been seeing jokel got a lot of time at left tackle so it was interesting to hear that he he confirmed that he was left guard brits at center we kind of knew that um then he talked about right guard, and he really started by saying, hey, Glowinski and Obushi, we know we can win with either one of them. Now it's just a battle to see which one can be most consistent. And then he talked about Afedi, and you know he's disappointed he missed a week, and uh, he thinks that hurt him, and he made some plays that he knows he wished he could have back, but you know he thinks he's going to be better better this week. And then he brought up so, – so I think that he was asked about Posick, and he uh, – Interesting. He's like, oh yeah, he's gonna get rotated in there. You're gonna see him rotating. We, and uh, first thing I thought is, oh sweet, he's gonna rotate in at right tackle. It's finally gonna happen. We're gonna see him against some some of the ones. Wasn't talking about right tackle. He was talking about right guard. And I was like, oh come on. I mean, like, okay, I guess that's better than nothing. But he followed up later with a comment about that they want to see if Postic is one of the best five. And I think that's an absolutely legitimate question to ask because I think he is. And um. Look, uh, I put it on Twitter. I, I've watched, I, I, I put in my notes. Everyone's high on Posick, and I think for good reason. Um, because you know what he does well? He actually is a good pass protector, and they don't have enough of those. He is not a great run blocker yet. He just isn't. Um, he's not that. I mean, he, he, he tries to finish things. I think there's some nastiness to him, which is great. But Fetty is a considerably better run blocker than Ethan Posick. And People don't want to hear it. It's all a Fetty sucks. He's a bust. And I understand because no one wants to see him pass block. It's not pretty. But this team's values run blocking. And um, as much the, the, the gap that Ethan Posick is better than Jermaine Effetti in pass protection, that's equally as big of a distance between where Effetti is as a run blocker to Ethan Posick. So... I think it's not as obvious as people want it to be that this is just a plug and play. We just got to make the switch. Um, I think they've got some questions. I do personally wonder, like, are we better with Ethan Posick <laughs> right guard and a Fetty at right tackle? Or do you flop them? You know, like maybe a Fetty is your right guard again and Posick's your better right tackle. Um, you can kind of go back and forth. And I'll stop talking. I know I'm rambling, but I would just say, one of the questions or one of the upsides, if he gets in there at right guard, is the hardest pressure for a quarterback to avoid is immediate interior pressure. So if Pothic is in there at one of the guards and Jokel's your other guard and Britt's your center, now you've got a potential to have a unified front on the interior of that line that could give Russell Wilson a pocket he really maybe has never had. 
And that's interesting. Yeah. And you mean, you make a good point. Postage might be a better fit if they're set on playing a Fetty at right tackle because yeah, you said it. Tom Cable has admitted when he was kind of going over what went wrong with Gary Gilliam last year. He wants that big, physical, mauling right tackle. And a Fetty for as heavy as his feet are and as much as he struggles in pass pro. And there was a play last game that reminded me so much of that play where Tom Brady tore his ACL when the guy almost went under the knee and took out Russell. It was close to that play. And I. I'm not the biggest Jermaine Fetty fan. I said on Twitter, I wouldn't even mind if he spent the next year, this year, spending on the bench learning his technique. But I don't think Tom Cable agrees with me. I think he's going to end up starting. So I think based on what I saw of Postich and based on what Pro Football Focus is grading him, I think he's got to be in your best five. And we said on Tuesday's show, Mark Lewinsky hasn't looked great either. And he really struggles with identifying blocks and picking up stunts and identifying, I guess, targeting in the second level. And if Postage can do that, yeah, if they're set on having a Fetty on the field, I'd rather have Postage as that right guard, maybe than the guys who've been battling there all summer. The other thing with Postage ended up being at, at right tackle is, you know, Abushi is still in this mix too, right? And so if you're talking about a Fant, Jokel, Britt, Abushi, Postage line, that's a heavy pass blocking unit, right? Like, uh, and that is a big departure. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, this is a team that wanted to get as big as you can possibly get and thought they could start Jamarcus Webb at right tackle last year. So for them to turn around and go from Jamarcus Webb at, uh, oh, the worst. yeah, well, and so you're right. I mean, that, that would be a huge, like, um, you know, kind of philosophical change for them. Yeah, so uh, can we talk about another position that for me jumped out this week in the game? Um, and I think is really, it, it shook up my roster projections. Um, and this is defensive line. So uh, going into the game, last week I had eight defensive linemen making the team. And uh, just quickly going back, on average, uh, last year they kept eight defensive linemen. So I was projecting the same amount. On average, they've kept, kept eight and a half defensive lineman on the team since 2010 when Pete Carroll and John Schneider started. Now I went and put up nine um, after this game. And the reason I increased it from eight to nine is a couple. Um, So first of all, um, uh, we did not get to see Marcus Smith play. And he was a guy that I had as high confidence going into this game. Uh, the reason I had him in high confidence, he was a former first round pick. They, they put in a lot of effort to, to get him. Uh, Pete Carroll likes what he's seen. And honestly, I like what I saw. I, I they've been putting him at linebacker. I don't see him as a linebacker. I don't think he has the movement skills to be a linebacker, but he's a decent pass rusher on the edge. He's got some nice movement there. Um, a nice, nice swim move. I've seen him do multiple times. So we haven't even seen him and I already had him pretty much making the roster. David Bass, Christian French, uh, I think Rodney Coe. Um, there's some interesting players on that defensive line. David Bass is a guy with five and a half sacks in the NFL. You know how many sacks Cassius Marsh has in the NFL in his career? Not many. Three. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like Cassius Marsh. I am a Cassius Marsh fan. And so, uh, you know, I think that now they've got additional um, – depth at that position i think it might mean that they cape one less linebacker than they were going to um i I currently don't have mike morgan making the team which uh, might be a surprise for some people but i'm curious while you're watching the film nathan um did you by any chance spend any time looking at david bass or christian french or did any of those guys kind of jump out to you yeah they rotated a lot of those guys um some of the pass rushers look pretty good uh garvin of course had a couple big splash plays um it'll be interesting with the number of safeties they have uh does that and talking about you know the the big nickel conversation that we had and what can you do with hill what can you do with mcdougald you know does thompson find a place on this team um do they just go away from that same position altogether right and then you you get rid of uh uh morgan right and does that open up a spot for smith or somebody like that or david pass um 
it's a little hard to kind of evaluate those guys um, when they're playing against, you know, third string um, sure. tackles, yep. you know, sometimes third string right tackles, which is uh, pretty rough. Um, but there wasn't a lot to complain about with any of those guys. A lot of them look pretty athletic. A lot of them, you know, I think Bass, when he got his sack, right, he showed a pretty nice inside move. I think that was him that, that had that. So um, the competition down there is pretty steep. Yeah, so Jeff, uh, you know, I looked back at the 2013 team, which is the, f- yeah. the most famous of our defensive lines. You know, everyone talks about that team. And I was curious, you know, like, am I crazy to say they might keep nine defensive linemen if they keep eight and they've averaged eight and a half? Like, maybe I'm just trying to see things. Well, that 2013 defensive line, they kept 11 defensive linemen out of the 53. Ooh. And that was with cutting... Clinton McDonald and Jay Howard and Ty Powell. So that was how deep the defensive line was. Crazy. Uh, I'm talking 11 at this point, but you know, can you, did you see any of the defensive linemen? We don't even talk about the guys there. I want to turn, talk, turn to Nazir Jones in a second. Cause I saw some great things from him, but of the edge guys of the, the, sorry, not edges in the wrong word, but other guys in the bubble, any guys that jumped out to you from the defensive line when you watched the game this weekend? Or the, well, this from game? the first, from the first game, it had to be David Bass. He totally jumped off the film a bunch of times, whether it was a speed rush or a power. And he got some time with the ones this week. And he, he was a guy I didn't really have in my radar. I figured he was almost a camp body. Just a guy to fill out, maybe develop some of the young guys from a positive standpoint. I think Bass has jumped himself into the competition. Every time Marcus Smith's name come up, he didn't play in the last game, and he's expected to play tomorrow. Every time his name pops up, Pete Carroll can't stop raving about him. And I think they love his speed off the edge. I think they love him as an option, kind of how Bruce Irvin was used on third down in that role. Maybe just competition with Marsh as an edge rusher in those NASCAR packages. And yeah, I think you have to mention Naz Jones. I know... He was probably a lock to make the team anyway, but all indications were he was a primary, mostly a run defender. He's kind of going to fill that Tony McDaniel role. He's more of a stout. That's what that's how he played in college. But in that first game, I don't want to compare him to Malik McDowell because Malik McDowell is a totally different size, skill set, off the bus, dominate, getting the quarterback's face kind of guy. He looked almost like the light version, not in terms of size, in terms of like skill set. Just the kind of guy that you can move five technique, three technique. He can get into the backfield. He was showing a lot more penetration than I thought he was. So when you add those kind of guys, I think I, I would have nine defensive linemen because Averill and Ben are a little older. You don't want to have to have them play 700 snaps or whatever they've played. And this defense is at a best when they can rotate guys in and out. And especially now that you don't have McDowell, for all indications, probably for the whole season. There's going to be injuries. There's going to be bad matchups. So if you can, I think it's the eight that you have, and I think it's going to be Bass versus Marcus Smith for that final spot. Yeah, I, you know, it's awesome to be able to have this conversation, right? Like, I mean, this is exactly what you want. Instead of like, God, who are they going to have to back up this guy? And what happens if this guy gets hurt? I mean, you can go, I think you can easily say that you're three or four deep at Leo. Like, I don't want to talk about if people get hurt, but you know, after Cliff Averill, you've got Frank Clark that can step in there. You've got Cassius Marsh that can step in there. Potentially, you've got Marcus Smith that could step in there. Potentially, you've got David Bass that could step in there. You know, that's those are big. It's not easy to find edge rushers. You know, people forget that Chris Clemens was a guy that this the John Schneider traded for. People talk about the draft picks and a bunch of the free agents. They took him off of uh, Philadelphia for nothing in a trade. Um, people remember Daryl Tapp. They got rid of him and and were able to get uh, a guy in Chris Clemens that had three straight years of you know ten sacks. I think uh, uh, double digit sacks. So um, they have a knack for this. And and I know I said it already, but David Bass at five and a half sacks, getting five and a half sacks in the NFL is not easy. Um, and he's he's a relatively he's been in their league for four years. He's bounced around different teams. There's probably a reason he's bounced around. He's not you know the second coming. But Pete Carroll has a way of taking advantage of talent that other people can't always take advantage of. So I really like what I saw there. I'm hoping that we see it again this, you know, tomorrow night. 
Um, uh, but I just loved, I loved his relentlessness. I, he was consistent off the ball and, and I think we're going to see more of him. I think we're going to get, see maybe some chances of him to play with the ones Naz Jones. Um, look, he's six foot five. He caused one of the turnovers by knocking a ball up in the air and creating an interception. He, one of the plays that Pete Carroll, I knew he was going to call it out because they love this from their defensive tackles. There was a screenplay that went for like yeah. 12, 15, 16 mm-hmm. yards. And who was the one that tackled the guy 16 yards downfield? It was Naz Jones from behind. And that kind of play is what they want to inspire from their young defensive tackles. Ataba Rubin's famous for it. Brandon Meebane was, you know, you know, good at that. Not necessarily as quick as uh, Rubin is shown to be, but I think that's great. And um, I-, I thought Christian French looks I- honestly. It's like wow, he was. They were high on him last year. He was always hurt and couldn't really get on the field. The guy had a sack. He had two fumble recoveries. Um, I think he had a special teams play as well. Um, so, so I think there's some interesting players there. Um, and I think if you ask about those guys that are younger, they got a little more upside. I'm not sure I see a place for Mike Morgan. The guys, you know, he's older. You know, they've got a lot of guys like Mike Morgan. They've got a Dewey McDonald and a Will Hoyt and a DJ Alexander and a Terrence Garvin that can all be linebackers that play on special teams. A lot of those guys can play multiple roles. So I think that these other younger defensive linemen are pushing Mike Morgan off the roster, and I think that's a great thing if you're a Seahawks fan and want to see the roster grow. Now, uh, we've got some questions on Twitter because people have been following along, and uh, I got a transition for us here if it's okay. Um, everybody wants to know about Mike Garofalo's comments, right? So um, I can't remember which one of you guys. We have our own little uh, private chat where I was talking about um, on Twitter. But someone brought up that um, it might have been CJ, um, who couldn't be with us tonight. CJ, we'll get you on one of these times. Um, but uh, he shared that, hey, uh, Garofalo said on, I think it was NFL Today or whatever that show is, that's super weird, um, by the way, uh, in the mornings. Uh, <laughs> good morning, football. Okay, good morning, football. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, he said, he had talked about the Seahawks for a couple minutes, and then he said, hey, I think they're going to sign Tremaine Brock. You know, they, they had him in, so that was, he'd already talked about that. And then after that, he said, he seemed like he a canary, you know, had a, a cat with a canary in his mouth, right? He 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 knew something. He couldn't share it, and he said, "Don't be surprised if the team tweaks the roster before the end of training camp, before they get in the regular season." And every Seahawks fan's ears perked up with that because what does that mean? What tweak could they be talking about? And uh, let's go round round table here on that one. Uh, uh, Jeff, when you, when you saw that the first time, when you heard that, what was your first thought of what that could mean? I first thought, and I know a lot of people have commented on this on Twitter, have been speculating was a trade to fill that defensive line role that Malik McDowell won't be able to fill this year at, by all locations. And I know Sheldon Richardson was a name that's been linked to the team and there's, a ton of areas where Seahawks have access and the Jets are a rebuilding team who are looking for younger players or maybe some contra- expiring contracts or whatever. But that was my first thought. That's kind of the one area I can see them making a trade because they really want that guy to disrupt. They wanted that six foot six guy to disrupt passing lanes, create more turnovers. And he's a guy that had been linked to the Seahawks and he even admitted he, they asked him to take a pay cut. And I don't know if they can work it in now that Britt, is done, but when I saw that tweak thing, I had the same inclination. He knows something. When I found it interesting about Mike, one of our followers tweeted him asking him about Brit and linked me and him in the same thing because I wrote him about the his comments too. And right before Ian came out, Mike gave us a heads up. Brit, the Brit deal is about to come, and a minute later, Rappaport tweeted out. So I found that very interesting that. Mike, who probably got hit up by a million Seahawks fans, happened to remember that someone linked it, included me, and somehow he remembered that right when it happened today. What about you, uh, Nathan? What was your first thought when you, you heard that? I mean, Sheldon Richardson, right? Immediately, they they were linked there in the off season a little bit, or I think they, what the, it, it broke a little while ago, right? That they had talked to the Jets about it. Um, so that's that's a big one. 
There's other things that are more tweaky, right, that are really littler. I think Richardson's more than a tweak, um, but, uh, I mean, he's the most exciting and, you know, probably of the realistic names. Well, I think you're right. And, um, by the way, folks that are watching on the live stream, I just – this is new for us. I'm just figuring out that there's a, a live chat pod. I've been looking for it on the, the Hangout, but it doesn't show here. Uh, so I'll take a look and see if there's some more questions there and we'll get to some of those. But, um, yeah, uh, my first thought was Sheldon Richardson and, um, you know, what I think is possible, especially now you start putting things together, Team, someone like John Schneider, he's got one move linked to another move. So the same way we talked at the very beginning of the show, Sign Cam Chancellor to extension so that you can sign Justin Britt to extension. Well, they just signed Tremaine Brock. Why are they on him? They didn't need him. They definitely didn't need Tremaine Brock the way the roster is built right now. But now that they got him and they clearly been on for four months, they were serious about him. What does that mean? It means that Jeremy Lane is a surplus. It means he is potentially someone that you can move. And we talked about, we spent some time talking about how you didn't know which of these, like, it's going to hurt if you have to give up DeAndre Elliott because he's not going to get through waivers. Someone's going to pick him up. It's probably going to hurt if you get rid of Pierre Desir. Someone may pick him up. And so how do you address that? Um, well, maybe you move that guy early. Maybe you move a guy like Jeremy Lane. Oh, by the way, he's younger. Um, you know, he, he's youngish, so he's still valuable. He's a Seahawks corner. He's got a contract for a few more years that's not too expensive. Um, and you move into a Jet team that needs corners and needs to grow. Maybe you take some of your surplus at another position. You've got surplus at defensive line. You've got a surplus at running back. you got a surplus at wide receiver. Maybe you package a couple of players and you package a draft pick. And, you know, I could see them moving a third-round pick plus a Jeremy Lane plus another player if they could get someone like Sheldon Richardson, I think that's a pretty tempting deal for a guy that's on the last year of his contract, probably will not sign with the Jets. Um, and the Seahawks have already talked to about. So, uh, you know, I don't know about all the salary cap stuff. Evan's gone. He's, you know, hopefully winning his game. But um, I do think that that's worth dreaming about it. You know, maybe it's not realistic. And I joked this morning that the hilarious thing would be if they traded Jermaine Curse and Jeremy Lane and got Sheldon Richardson in a turn, I feel like Seahawks Twitter would never be the same. Uh, but, you know, if they got a Sheldon Richardson, a Super Bowl or bust, I mean, I'm already pretty excited about where the team's going, but you add a guy like that um, that can step in and pass rush on the interior, wow. Um, I, I think that would be huge. Um, you know, it gets interesting, though, when you start to talk about, like, that player, right? I mean... Maybe you, you do something with Lane or Curse or something like that for money reasons, right? But like, if you start talking about players to send out in a, a Richardson trade or, or whoever it might be, you know, if the Jets are asking for Paul Richardson, if the Jets are asking for Thomas Rawls, uh, those, you know, you can, you can start to look at some of these younger guys that the Jets would maybe be interested in, right, from a, a rebuilding perspective that kind of start to get a little painful to talk about giving away. Like Richardson, maybe not as much. I mean, the dude seems to be, I mean, he's unbelievable when he's on the field. He's just not on the field, right? So maybe you're just like, yeah, go for it, right? I mean, get get rid of that. Um, but Thomas Rawls is another guy, young running back, cheap. You know, they got Matt Forte, who you would think is on his last legs. Maybe they're interested in somebody like that. Um, what if they're interested in Jermaine Effetti? Uh, so when you start to about, talk about the different players that Seattle could include that are younger, that might intrigue the jets, it gets kind of, I mean, it's fun to talk about at least, right? I don't know how much, how realistic please, any of this please, is, but <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, that? they took Carpenter and that worked out good for them. So maybe you just tell them, you know, Hey, get him a good offensive line coach and you, you know, you got something there. <laughs> <laughs> ouch ouch uh, going, nathan's going for the jugular on the first show here uh jeff i mean nathan just named a bunch of players some of them are less comfortable than others um you know would you be comfortable if, if thomas rawls was the name and you were left with an eddie lacy and a cj Procise and a chris carson and what do you think about something like that honestly yes i would be comfortable with that as much as it would hurt to trade thomas rawls who i i assume we're all big fans of 
on the field and he's been a really good player for them and he's affordable he's a bull he really sparks the team but if they can fit it under their cap which i'm not sure they can you you just having a guy like sheldon richardson would really put this team over the top and they're loaded with depth at running back chris and chris carson he could give you a pretty good amount of Thomas Rawls' production, assuming that he's as good as we think he is. And yeah, I think running backs just are at a, such a point where they don't have much value in the NFL. And if you can get a dominant defensive line for a running back, unless they're David Johnson or Le'Veon Bell, I'm doing that any day of the week, as much as I love Thomas Rawls. And getting back to Jeremy Lane for a second, this is just a quick comment. I think another team to watch with him is the Oakland Raiders. Reggie McKenzie and John Schneider are super tight. And I don't know if you guys saw what happened with Sean Smith. He's been um he's been alleged with um a, an incident. So and he's had he had a really rough season last year. And Ken Norton Jr. is their defensive coordinator. He knows Lane very well. They've had a history of picking up Seahawks players, Marshawn Lynch, Bruce Irvin, a bunch of guys are around there. So Smith. I know we can get back to the Garofalo, Sheldon Richardson, but don't be surprised. They have a they have a lot of offensive linemen, they have defensive linemen. That could be a match for Lane. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't think they're, I don't think they're wanting to move Lane. I mean, that's not my perception. I, I just, I guess my read of it is that they now have a surplus at that role, and and they they have the flexibility that if the right deal comes along, they could, um, they could do it. And you know. I don't know what they would be wanting to get back from the Raiders that would make sense um, to, to kind of weaken. Like, I don't think they want to go from a position of strength to a position of, you know, less strength. I think they'd like to go from a position of strength to a position of strength. And so in this case, I think they've got the the depth to kind of deal with uh, Elaine departure as long as they're getting someone who can really make a difference on the team. And Sheldon Richardson, look, you could say he's a one-year rental, and he probably would be most most likely he would be. But let's talk about a couple things there for a second. I know we've been on for a while. I appreciate people sticking with us. But uh, one, Michael Bennett and Cliff Averill are not getting any younger. And Sheldon Richardson is a younger defensive lineman. He is potentially a franchise level defensive lineman when he's right. Um, if he works out really well, you know, it gives you some potential options to keep him around you may decide to invest in him they they had a couple guys they had cliff Averill, michael bennett on one year deals and guess what they stuck around number two if he does really well and you have the decision between him and a jimmy graham um if he's doing that well choice between a disruptive defensive lineman and a and a you know pro bowl all pro tight end for me that's a pretty easy decision. I will go defensive line every day of the week um, on that. So I think there's some interesting things there. We can still talk about Sheldon Richardson, and that's fine. But I do want to point out there's that's not the only possible tweak that he could have been that Mike Garofalo could have been talking about. The other one that I think is less exciting but also possible is I think the Seahawks have been slow playing, potentially slow playing Colin Kaepernick, and. Uh, he was in. I think they had the conversation. I think they knew what he wanted. Wasn't necessarily what they wanted. I think they were a little farther apart. They wanted to see what they had. Kaepernick probably wanted to go out and see if he could get a starting role somewhere, see if he can get more money. And it's clearly not working out. Every role keeps coming up, and he's not the he, – he's in the game of musical chairs, he's the one without a seat. So if the whole preseason goes by and he has nowhere to go, and he has to accept, you know, really low salary, and he'd have to accept being a backup. Do the Seahawks potentially consider saying, "Hey, we'd rather have Kaepernick than either Trayvon Boykin and Austin Davis"? They might have to jump the Jaguars first. Have you seen these Bortles highlights tonight? Have any of you guys seen these? <laughs> no. Oh no. my God! I, I've been wa- I've been watching them a little bit on my phone. It is awful, and there's going to be a ton of Kaepernick Jaguars talk tomorrow. Just watch. But from the Seahawks' standpoint, I think it would surprise me. I think if they were going to do it, they would have done it a while ago just so they can install him into the offense and use this time. I know training camp is such an important time, especially when you're learning a new playbook and a new scheme. 
I, I just think they're going to end up going with Boykin, but I don't, I don't know if Nathan thinks differently he can jump in here. I personally don't see it, but it would definitely be interesting. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. I think it would be a weird move to do at this point. Um, again, no all 22, so really passing judgment on Boykin. Uh, Boykin is a little tough, um, but he looked all right. Um, and so it might have been one of those where they talked to him, he wanted to be a starter, they didn't know what they had in Boykin, so they just said, okay, you go shop yourself around, we'll let training camp play out with uh, Boykin and, and see what we have, and uh, not a lot of, I mean, I guess he's looked rough in practice, right, but he showed up in the game, so um, doesn't feel like they're in a spot where they need to, to do that, um, because I, I, I don't think it's possible for Kaepernick, right, I mean, he, he's been in the league enough years that he can't be as cheap as Boykin, so even if he comes at a minimum, it's going to be more, they're going to be spending more of that spot than they would if they just roll with what they got. Yeah, I I think it's pretty unlikely. Um, but that was the only other thing I could come up with that, you know, from a tweak perspective, I mean, are they going to tweak the running back position? No, they're going to tweak the, you know, tight end position. I don't think so. Uh, wide receiver. Odell Beckham. <laughs> hey, <laughs> maybe. All right, you want you want to make gonna, a case of how an Odell Beckham's coming to Seattle? Uh, I mean, they they didn't trade they 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 missed their shot to trade for their skill player, and they got a first round pick. Uh, and OBJ is amazing, so there's there's your case. <laughs> I'm gonna dream on it. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but All I right. can dream about it. All and right. they won't find a way to use him in the red zone. That, well, of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they'll probably put him on offensive line uh, <laughs> convert him. So. All right, fellas. I think we've uh, we've tortured people enough for the night. Um, it's been great having you on, Nathan. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, it was fun. And uh, a thanks again to to Steam Bron- Steam Donkey Brewery. Uh, I apparently drank a little too much uh, of their wonderful ale tonight. Um, make sure to visit them next time you're down there in Aberdeen. Um, they make great stuff. And uh, uh, Jeff, you want to close us out? Yeah. Um- Tomorrow we're going to be watching the game closely. Uh, We're going to be back on next week with our usual show. I think the new format really worked out well. There wasn't any any technical issues tonight. Things went very smoothly. And we'll be back on with this great content next week, breaking down the game and previewing the most important preseason game there is, the third one. And as there is every week, every time we get ready to do a show, all this news floats out of the air. So... Every week, there's going to be lots to talk about, and we're going to keep putting on good guests, and we're going to keep bringing on lots of people you guys know around the Seahawks community. So hope you guys are enjoying what we're doing, and if you guys have any feedback, please send it to me or Brian or Nathan, and we'd love to hear from you because I've gotten great stuff so far, and it, it, it really touches me how many people are listening to this and how much people are liking this kind of content because that was the vision I saw, and I'm really excited about this so far. Yeah, one last thing. Sorry, I know I said you could finish it, but... Hey, click subscribe uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, you'll get notified when this stuff's happening. It's a great way to, to stay in tune. And join Hawk Blogger Insiders, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash um, Hawk Blogger uh, for as little as five bucks a month. Um, you guys get access to a private Facebook group page um, where we talk. You get access to all of us. We talk about stuff on the side. <laughs> it's people that are not nasty like Twitter, so... You can ask whatever you want. It can be any question you have, and we'll try to help you out. Um, all this money, um, you know, goes to two places. It either goes straight to charity, um, or you know, uh, it goes to buying some access to stat packages. And and one of those things that we uh, bought this this year is access to Pro Football Focus. There's no other site that I know of that's going to have access to that. And uh, so you're going to start seeing some of those stats come out. I started sharing them earlier this week on actual player grades. You can't get them anywhere else. Um, so thank you to, to thank you. And if you see anyone else, uh, that's a Hawk blogger insider, thank them for giving a uh, granting access. Uh, we've given over $60,000 to Ben's fund, um, over the course of, of time with Hawk blogger and, uh, at the pace we're at right now with, with Hawk blogger insiders, we may have a record year. We may be given $20,000 just this year. Um, if we keep this up, so join, it's fun. It's a great way to talk Seahawks. We'll give you special access. We'll, we'll break down stuff outside of, um, you know, regularly scheduled public stuff. Um, and it's, it's just a good chance to make some Seahawks friends. So uh, give it a shot. It's fun. And uh, we'll talk more later.
Take care, everybody.